Hello, uh, welcome to AOSC 661 Sustainability Modeling for Spring 2015. This is lecture number one, and it is essentially an introduction to the class. Uh, let's uh, see what the contents of this lecture are. Um, I think I'll tell you a little bit about this class in more detail, um, besides what you may have already know. Uh, we'll look at um, some sustainability concepts and a little history uh, behind the um, the whole concept of sustainability and uh, the reason uh, for modeling within the sustainability context. Um, so we'll do um, a little bit of understanding of, of why modeling and specifically why modeling sustainability uh, and we'll go through some initial examples. So let me tell you a little bit about this class. We'll talk about the rationale, you know, why why this class? Why take this class? We'll go through the syllabus in some detail today. Uh, we'll talk about the class logistics. Uh, this class has a, uh, it's being taught for the first time in this format that's a little bit hybrid uh, with class lectures uh, supported by videos and online material. Um, and some of the tools that we're gonna be using uh, to deliver the contents of the class. So let's talk a little bit about the rationale for the class. Um, this class is essentially experimental in nature. And by that, we mean that we are not only uh, introducing uh, or integrating concepts of sustainability into a single class, but it's also the format that will be taught and the tools that we'll use to, to, um, to go through the topics. I developed this class with the philosophy that it would be a modeling class for students with non-modeling backgrounds. And why, what I mean by that is that I'm essentially using sustainability as a topic to teach modeling. Um, and because people that do sustainability come from non-modeling backgrounds, uh, I wanted to have this class that would actually serve that audience. Uh, so sustainability is being used as a means for the class, not an end in itself. So this is not a class on sustainability per se, but it's a class on modeling that uses sustainability as a means to teach you some models. And um, you will learn um, how to deal with sustainability in a more quantitative sense by doing this. Um, and uh, I see this class as contributing to the evolving field of sustainability science, so being a component of it. Let's move on to the syllabus. Uh, the, the course synopsis that I um, that I put in, I, and I, I hate these wordy slides, but I just wanted to capture some key words in the course synopsis that I offered in um, the course syllabus that was circulated earlier. Um, really, this class is it's uh, for students who are concerned with sustainability issues. Okay, so that's uh, it's, it's first and foremost the the, the first interest has to be on sustainability issues. You can, you can get a modeling class in other topics elsewhere. So this is gonna be a modeling class on sustainability matters or issues. Um, and we're gonna be honing in on understanding what modeling can do to help solve sustainability problems, okay? So modeling is gonna be a tool to solve these problems. Um, we're gonna be focusing very much on quantitative understanding. So it's this is really, a class about crunching numbers um, and understanding what these numbers mean and understanding where these numbers come from and understanding the way these numbers are arrived at, how they may vary under different assumptions. Um, and um, a lot of the modeling is going to be directed at uh, designing, you know, policy measures. So it's, it's really, uh, you know, one nice feature of the way I've tried to design this class is that I want to go from 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 the model from the modeling and from the from the um, mathematics and number crunching to really cross the, the bridge to designing uh, policy measures that affect these sustainability issues. To do that, we're going to be using something that's um, been around for a few decades, um, at least in in in, in formal form, um, which is system dynamics or system dynamics theory, uh, and. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to be using tools that will allow you to uh, get hands-on knowledge of, of these um, of these tools and how they are used. Uh, so, uh, my aim uh, with this class is that it's a class that's open to students of all backgrounds. Uh, so, 
is not for students that have a, a purely a scientific or natural science background or, or, or purely policy background or, or purely modeling background. I think it's a, it's a class that has mass appeal and hopefully that that will be the outcome. So um, let's see if we can get there this semester. It will be very, very interesting. Um, let me um, move on to the learning objectives. Um, and um, yeah, these are also detailed in, in the syllabus, but I wanted to highlight um, and explain a little bit of what's what's behind them. I, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, it's um, it's about introducing students to to key issues in sustainability, not isolate them and in of themselves, but actually how they interact with each other. So this is really uh, about uh, making understanding these interactions and understanding them. Um, at, at different scales, um, and we'll look at issues that go from local to regional to global scales, and and um, you know different issues will 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 be uh, approached from from any of these scales. Uh, I think the next piece is that we're going to be analyzing these these interactions from again quantitatively. We're going to be focusing on, on really uh, on, on on number crunching quantities um, and uh, trying to understand what's behind these these numbers, um, we're going to be um, using models to handle um, interdisciplinary data. This is data that comes from different disciplines in sustainability, and using system dynamics modeling as a as a, as a tool for this integration um, of data. Um, and um, I think uh, one piece that that um, hasn't been mentioned and I wanted to emphasize is also to understand the limitations of, of, of these models and these tools, not only um, because of assumptions that we make, but also because there's a lot of uncertainty in, in, uh, in the data and in, in, the, um, in the issues themselves. So I think, uh, again, um, we're going to be trying to quantify what this uncertainty is. At least, you know, it's, it's one thing to, don't, to know that you don't know something, but at least if you, if you if you don't know what it is, but you you do know that it's some within some uncertainty range, then you have a much better idea of how to how to handle it. And we're going to be, you know, looking at uh, at this with a series of examples in a series of topics. Okay, so that's sort of the um, you know the uh, the learning objectives, looking at the interaction, you know, quantitative, uh, interdisciplinary, system dynamics modeling, and uncertainty. Um, in the syllabus for the class, I go over uh, topic by topic of what we're going to be covering in each lecture. However, I want to give you a quick rundown of what we're going to be covering in the class. Uh, today is an introduction to the class, uh, and um, we'll continue that through this week. A little bit of motivation of why this class is um, is needed, why what it, why is it useful. Uh, Next week, we're going to be looking at modeling as a discipline and how modeling as a tool can be used to address sustainability issues. So it'll be a general introduction to modeling as well. Then we're going to start getting into specific sustainability issues. And the one to start with will be uh, the human trigger population and how that uh, sort of uh, starts uh, most sustainability issues. Um, then we're going to see how uh, humans interact. We're going to be looking at social interactions and how these aggregate uh, and impact sustainability issues. Uh, then we're going to start looking at uh, human nature interactions uh, and uh, how uh, that uh, interface uh, sort of shapes uh, most uh, sustainability problems. Um, the economic angle to sustainability is key, so we're going to be introducing some economic variables um, into the system, in, into the mix of, of modeling, how that uh, how that distills uh, some potential avenues to analyze sustainability issues. Uh, uh, then we're going to tackle um, uh, issues like the climate and and, and climate change, uh, and how that has brought uh, some new light and some new pressures on sustainability. Uh, we're going to talk about water um, as a resource and and water as a key. Um, element in uh, sustainability matters um, when we're looking at energy uh, and uh, how that uh, impacts and how it mixes up with all these other resources. Uh, we are also going to be looking um, at, uh, at food and food production um, and, um, and how these are linked and how are, uh, how are these connections uh, made. We're going to be uh, looking at uh, disease uh, and how 
you know, sustainability and the seas are related. Um, uh, we are going to uh, be looking at biodiversity um, issues and uh, how it's connected to sustainability as well. Uh, we're going to go then to look at, um, answer this, this age-old question of whether there are limits to growth, uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting debate. Uh, by this time in the class, we'll have enough elements to have an educated debate and recognize uh, some of the elements uh, uh, on, on sort of both sides of the answer, on the multiple sides of the answer to that question, probably. Um, and then we're going to close the class by looking at sustainability as an integrated topic um, and how all these variables uh, that we have been discussing in each of the lectures, how they come together to try to answer, you know, sort of the, you know, the big you know, problems of the world, you know, um, you know, poverty and, and food production and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, how society can hold itself together over time. One of the aspects I'm sure uh, you're interested in uh, learning about is how this class is going to be graded. Uh, and grading of this class is going to be a combination of, of four items. Uh, you know, we will have a, a midterm exam, and this won't really be an exam. It'll be actually, um, you'll be asked to write a blog post, and uh, we're going to be publishing that blog post uh, on, on, on a site. And um, I'll be grading uh, you not only on the, on the, on the quality of, of the post itself, uh, but also on uh, the interactions, the comments that you make on your fellow colleagues' uh, uh, posts. So it'll be, it'll be a, a good way to, to gauge not only what you write, but also how you interact with each other. Uh, we're going to have a term paper, which will be uh, essentially a, on a topic of your choice. You're going to be developing a, a system dynamics model to simulate that. Uh, and I'll give you indications of, as to the format and how that's going to be done. Um, There'll be a final exam. The final exam is essentially going to be a, the presentation um, um, of, of your term paper. So these two essentially are going to be combined um, uh, for the class. And then we'll have a class, class discussion and participation, which will be arranged uh, through our uh, online um, mechanism for interaction. And um, in, in, I, in previous uh, uh, offerings of this class, I used... Um, uh, Facebook to, uh, to, to get a discussion page and there were some concerns about using Facebook uh, uh, because of you know people sort of wanted to keep their social from their classwork separate so I decided to go to LinkedIn this time which is a which is a very nice tool because it allows you uh, to um, you know essentially interact with with networks of professionals so we'll have a link LinkedIn group uh, LinkedIn also has a nice feature that allows you to uh, publish blogs and, and op-eds which is uh, sort of uh, ties into the first part of the of the grading of the class. So we're going to be I'll, I'll chat with you about us, you know, how we're going to be setting up this LinkedIn discussion group. Let's talk about class logistics. Uh, so this class will be taught through a combination of in classroom and online lectures. Uh, so we will likely for most weeks will be meeting Mondays in class. Wednesdays we won't meet. Um, unless directed otherwise, but uh, you are expected to spend time with the online materials. Um, we will also have a combination of in-classroom and online discussions, and this is going to play into that discussion part of your grade. Um, I'll make all class materials, that means uh, the lectures, videos, readings, uh, uh, will be available for viewing anytime um, in a dedicated um, a Dropbox folder that, that we'll create for this class that hasn't been created for this class, but also through the LinkedIn page. Um, and uh, I will also be posting all the instructions uh, uh, for the classes, for the deadlines, um, uh, also through the LinkedIn um, and through the Dropbox um, uh, mediums. Um, approach, um, uh, let's talk now a little bit about uh, sustainability. and. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you've probably taken another class on sustainability. If you haven't, I thought it would be a good idea anyway to uh, try to define what sustainability is. And um, so sustainability is, um, and I picked up a few definitions that I found on dictionaries and on the web, the capacity to endure. Well, it's kind of a, a general definition, which is fine. Uh, not Probably not my favorite. Um, 
Um, a more traditional one that I found was a method of harvesting or using a resource so that the resource is not depleted or permanently damaged, which starts getting at the at the relationship between using a resource and the, the state of the resource uh, in, in the future, okay? And, and that's a little bit of what um, I want to talk about. Um, now, the definition that I found, the quality of not being harmful to the environment or depleting natural resources and thereby supporting long-term ecological balance. Again, um, you can start seeing you know, a couple of emerging things here. One is the, the, the use of a resource, and second is it's the time, um, the time issue, you know, how, you know, what are going to be the impacts of that use into the future. The definition I, I sort of continue to like the most is the definition that, um, that was put forth by the United Nations in the uh, late 80s, um, which um, sounds something like uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So... I think the, the the key items that need to be captured here is that there is a there is a relationship between uh, resource use in the present, resource use in the future, and satisfying needs in the present and in the future. If, and, and the balance of all that is what um, it's it's this concept, this elusive concept that we that we refer to as sustainability. So it's not a static it's not a static concept, but it's a concept that has that has evolved over time and they will continue to evolve over time, okay? Um, so, I want to do a little bit of history and um, I, I want to um, look at the work um, that I consider to be the sort of the, the first attempt to, to formally uh, pose the questions of whether um, humanity, our world, our lives uh, were sustainable. Um, in a in in a more or less quantitative fashion, so I, I, I it's it's um, it's not just about posing the question. Uh, that's uh, that tends to be uh, posing questions, um, and uh, in, in in the context has has been done. But uh, posing questions and in, 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 in trying to answer them in a quantitative way has not been done that frequently, particularly not in sustainability. And uh, so uh, the first of those works was the, was the work of. of Thomas, of the Reverend Thomas Malthus, and we'll talk a little bit about that, of Malthusian analysis. Um, we'll look at the, uh, historically, what followed that um, in the uh, agricultural agrarian revolution uh, that took that you know took place, and I'll talk, tell you a little bit about that, and we'll look also at that a little bit more detail later on when we discuss food production. Um, the... Um, the issue of the of the tragedy of the commons, which um, was a, a piece of seminal work that uh, that came about that really tackled um, uh, the 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 notion of the use of a common resource um, and and the different approaches that can that I can take, uh, and that was a, a very interesting um, a piece of work that was published in the late 1960s based on and you know some historical data that had been gathered for a couple of centuries um, then we'll talk uh, a little bit about uh, this um, the study in the 1970s that, I, that that it would be probably what I would call the, the first attempt to look at sustainability from a modeling standpoint so not not just quantitatively like Malthus did but actually you know, using computational models and, and system dynamics uh, tools. Uh, and this was the, the Limits to Growth study uh, that was um, uh, published in the, in the 1970s. Um, and then we'll move on just to introduce some of the, you know, what I call the today issues, you know, when and we talked a little bit about these in the syllabus, water, food, energy, and the economy. So let's move on to um, to the study of uh, the work of Thomas Malthus. Um, and uh, uh, Thomas Malthus was was a reverend who, um, um, in um, 18th century, well, late 18th century, beginning of 19th century, England um, uh, published a series of works uh, that became known um, uh, for uh, for his concerns about population growth and and sustainability. So I I would say that this is perhaps uh, the first uh, work to tackle what we know as sustainability today, and and I think that's that's fairly accurate uh, to say this. 
um, he authored um, the essay on the principle of population. And there were six editions of this uh, report uh, or, or this essay that were published between 1798 and 1826. Um, and um, and Malthus, uh, cent Malthus' central issue was um, the unequal nature of a food supply to population growth or our ability to produce food uh, to feed the population as it was growing. Um, and, um, you know, this of course centered in what we would call today um, the exponential or, or, or geometric growth versus the linear or ar arithmetic growth. And, of, um, and um, if, you, if, you, if you think about it very simply, um, and um, let's uh, take a look at a a um, you know a couple of graphs um, you know the first graph uh, just um, uh, sort of shows what exponential growth looks like versus linear growth and exponential growth essentially it's uh, it's growth that is multiplied or that's dependent on the number of population that's present so let's say you know very simply um, you know if for the very beginning uh, there was one person this person uh, or actually there should be two people so they can reproduce um, uh, so um, you know they they have uh, a number you know number of, of, of children let's say they have two children um, so the first generation produces two but each of these two um, uh, is able to produce two more and then what you what you start having is that you have um, a, um, a an accelerated growth curve which is the blue curve there on the left um, that's, um, that's referred to as, uh, as exponential, and that is referred to population. Um, Malthus argued that food production was at best going to be able to follow uh, a linear growth model, meaning that it will, um, it's essentially, if, you know, technology in food production would allow food to grow over time um, such that, in, you know, um, the amount of food produced per year would increase uh, by, by a constant amount. Okay, so that was that was Malthus' assumption, and that's uh, you know what's called linear food production or, or li linear uh, growth uh, for food. So Malthus' concern was that essentially uh, we're going to be running this into a situation where um, the even even if uh, it, like the growth you know the, if you look at the curve on the right, even if the linear curve is it's for time. It's higher than the the, the exponential uh, curve of population. At some point, um, the population growth was going to overtake um, our ability to produce food, and you know, and we would crash. So that was the that was essentially the concern. Um, and uh, now this concern today, we understand that was driven by that the assumption that um, food production would you know would would follow this linear growth. Uh, model um, and um, it was interesting and, and, and I, it was published in 1798 and, and I have here a little picture of, of the of cover page of the original study but you can actually see the whole study in, in, in some of these links um, the first two links cover you know the entire um, you know the entire uh, essay um, the, the the third link there that I encourage you to see is um, a nice uh, summary of, of the history uh, and what, you know, how, how that study by Malthus was actually, you know, taken up by the, by the, you know, how it was criticized and what happened with it over time. So now, needless to say, um, you know, Malthusian analysis and Malth you know, the Malthusian predicament um, um, was sort of, you know, it, it had a high impact when it happened, you know, in the, in the beginning of the the 19th century, but then um, the um, this agricultural revolution sort of came about, and um, what started happening is that there were changes um, introduced uh, around the world in the 18th and 19th century that allowed agriculture and food production to grow at, at a much faster rate that, that Malthus had predicted. So um, this created sort of a backlash. Um, towards uh, this the Malthusian um, predictions the Malthusian judgments that you know that uh, population was going to overtake food production and we were all going to die that the the world had no future and 
Um, and uh, we start living in a, in a, in a uh, for a couple of centuries, start living in ages where that saw a lot of progress. Um, and um, a, a big part of that progress was in food production and, and this agricultural revolution. The changes that were, the, were introduced were, you know, anything from new crops uh, to uh, rotation of crops. So you could use the same piece of land and, 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 um, and, and, cr and have several harvests of several crops during the year so as to keep production going. It was not just, uh, you know, um, a bimodal in which you would grow part of the year and then, and then the, the rest of the year not. Um, the introduction of new and improved breeds of, um, of you know, of, um, of uh, crops, um, infrastructure, um, you know, better, better buildings to store and to, uh, and to conserve um, um, uh, food, um, uh, drainage purposes, better ways to, to have irrigation, uh, more in efficient irrigation, so that uh, uh, the per land, per land unit production of crops could grow. Um, um, the use of fertilizers, new implements, um, became, you know, became new, um, you know, um, became new ways to accelerate fruit production. Um, so this had backlash on the whole Malth Malthusian um, uh, theory that was based on essentially uh, the fact that fruit production had, was, was tapped out, you know, or the rate of fruit production was tapped out. This demonstrated, this agricultural revolution demonstrated that, um, you know, essentially, innovation and improvements could really turn things around and uh, ameliorated that concern of population. Um, and, uh, and this actually revolution, uh, you know, w went well into the 20th century, um, you know, and especially in the 1960s, um, there was a, a, a sort of the, another big expansion with, uh, you know, high yield varieties of, of, of cereals and and um, more irrigation, better irrigation infrastructure, better management, um, uh, synthetic fertilizers. So the chemical industry uh, took off and um, and really um, um, uh, created uh, this um, powerful um, uh, powerful growth of food production that really uh, uh, through the predictions that Malthus had made at the beginning of the 19th century completely away because you know. There were about 100, you know, 150, 160 years went by where uh, the world saw a, a, a really large growth uh, in the food production um, and completely quelch uh, these concerns um, of competition with population growth. So, um, so that sort of went away. And, and um, I, I think what, ha what, you know, what happened as a result is that population growth really took off exponentially. And, and if you look at that population growth curve, the exponential, you can see that as, as time progresses, the slope starts getting, you know, steeper and steeper. So we really started growing as a population very, very fast. So this gets us into the 1970s or thereabouts, or the, you know, sort of the, the 60s and 70s, when we started looking again at the data and saying, yes, population is growing very fast, and yes, Food is also food production has also you know grown fast, um, and we're we're going back into a situation where we should start thinking about um, how to balance these two. Um, and it was interesting that for um, over two hundred years of history, uh, sustainability was was the competition between population growth and food production. It would, and you know and and, and um, what we can, we'll see today, and we'll start seeing this class, that there are a whole, whole, whole host of other issues that, that are involved. Um, now, this late 60s to the, to the uh, tragedy of, of the commons. And, um, you know, this is a study that, that, that uh, was, pu was published in, um, in 1968 um, uh, by um, a... Um, I, I th Let's see the the, the the classical paper by by, by Harding um, in 1968. But actually, the studies were was conducted or or the the this work focused on um, on villages in England um, before 1750. And um, in those days, uh, these villages had uh, large nearby areas that belonged to the village. Okay, um, and um, these common areas were, were not held in any 
sort of private ownership, but members of the village could raise their sheep on their land and also, um, and often released uh, their, their extra sheep to the commons. And the idea was that, um, you know, I'll feed the sheep with my resources, but there's a common pool also that I can, I can use and there's really no, no one stopping me from doing it. Um, so these users reasoned that even if their animals on the commons did not grow well um, because of overconsumption of the grass, any growth was a benefit that would have not otherwise have materialized. So whatever happened outside in the commons was extra. So, um, so, but what happened is that if, if everybody starts doing that and everybody starts consuming from the commons, um, in an uncontrolled and uncoordinated way, then the, the outcome of that, and that's what, uh, Harding shows in his paper is that, um, essentially this results in, in, in the collapse of the commons and essentially the death of all the sheep. So it's, uh, as well, it's called the tragedy of, of the commons and, and it's, um, it was an interesting um, study because it, it, it gave some theoretical basis to the approach of use of resources by individuals um, in different ways, um, in, in a sort of an individualistic way, um, you know, every, every person on its own or in a collective way in which, and, and this started putting some, um, some theoretical meat on, on, um, on the on, on the science of sustainability, so to speak. So I, I would say that you know, in addition to the work by Malthus, then this tragedy of the commons work was an, a second major piece, and it took up you know, like I said, it took a couple hundred years um, to get from one to the other, almost uh, 170 years actually to get from one to the other. Now, now there's a there's a nice video that I encourage you to see, um, um, and I'll let you watch that on your own. I'll I'll, I'll post. This video as well on our YouTube page that so has has a very nice explanation of, of the issue of the tragedy of the commons that I encourage you to see and we're going to come back as well uh, to this when we discuss economics and social behavior and how we model that okay um, the the next piece um, of, of of work has to do it, it was very very uh, short shortly thereafter um, from the tragedy of the commons work and was the, the, the limits to growth uh, publication. And um, this was a study that was commissioned by the Club of Rome, which is an international think tank that, that was founded in, in the 60s and it's still in existence today. Um, and um, it, it was really the first study of its kind um, in that it attempted to computationally simulate global sustainability issues. So to me, this is the the Limits to Growth study of, of 1972, the first edition, became the, uh, this was essentially, um, you know, 40 years ago, um, it, became, it, it became the first attempt to try to simulate what would happen in the world under different scenarios of growth, okay? Um, and um, to use this, uh, um, the researchers developed uh, a, um, a model um, that was referred to as the world three. I, I have never quite found out whether there was ever a world one or two. Um, but you know, all I know is that there's, uh, there's model world three that actually still exists. And I'll tell you a little bit about it today. Um, the study became quite controversial because, um, I think unfortunately, uh, and this is just my opinion. I, I, I think it, it focused more on the policy implications. Um, so, uh, only the outside of the study got a look. Okay, so um, so I, I think people sort of read, um, you know, how I, you know, like, what I like to say, you know, people went straight to the conclusions of the report, read only those couple of pages, and then um, never really stopped to understand what was behind it. And I, I think that there was a lot, that the most valuable uh, piece of work, and the reason that the limits to growth, in my opinion, you know, uh, has had such an impact, and and probably the reason that that no other study to date has had that same impact is, is because of of what was inside the, the methods that were used and, and the, the potential um, uh, for it. And, and and much of the um, much of, of what we'll be learning in this class has its roots in in, in, in the science that was developed for this limits to growth study. Um, 
Now, interestingly, um, and, and we'll see that in, in, in this class in, 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 a, in a few lectures time, it's, this study was followed by, by uh, what was referred to as a 30-year update. So the, the same scientists sort of got together in 2000 or near, uh, thereabouts and looked at, well, so we predicted 30 years ago this was going to happen. What has actually happened? And then and try to see what, you know, what was right and what was wrong and why, et cetera. And actually, it turned out that uh, a lot of the trends that were identified were, were right on the money. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so I, I want to talk um, briefly some more about the World 3 model because it's, it's really a, uh, it's the kind of tool um, that we're going to be um, looking at. We're not going to be uh, simulating the whole world. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll probably tackle uh, some more specific issues. But uh, the science that's there, um, it, it's uh, really the kind of, uh, the kind of approach um, that um, that we'll be using, you know, um, with uh, with the corresponding updates that have taken place over you know the past four years. But this model um, essentially used um, a, a a set of, of of five quantitative variables to um, understand what was happening in the world and what would likely happen in the world under under you know different scenarios and. The first variable is is population. Okay, so these are quantitative variables. So these are these are um, variables that um, uh, can be quantified and can be used to understand the state of the world. So population of the world is is one key variable that tells us where the world is. Capital is another variable. This is the sort of the amount of of, of capital. This has to do not just with money but also with infrastructure. Uh, services and, and um, the amount of, of capital that exists in the world. Food, okay, again, we, uh, we go back to food production as one of the key variables um, uh, that drives sustainability. Um, the state of non-renewable resources, okay, uh, and, uh, and how use of these resources uh, to, uh, to live and to produce capital and to generate food um, and to grow population is used. And um, and then you know a side effect of, of, of growth, which is pollution, and, and, and the, the the limit to growth uh, study, the World Three model, had um, sort of a pollution variable in there to account for the fact that that uh, population growth and capital growth and food production and, and resource depletion led to uh, a um, a measure of uh, degradation of the surrounding environment, which was referred to as pollution. So those were the five um, variables that were um, that were used in this study. Okay, so let me show you just um, let me just show you a um, um, typically what uh, the output of this model looks like. And and um, I hope the curves are clear, but you can see in in, in the graph there are, there are five curves, um, and there's a time horizon between 1900 and 2100. So what they did um, was that they looked at what had happened in the world between 1900 and 1970, which is where they cut off uh, the data um, um, to develop the models. And then they looked at what would happen between 1970 and the next 130 years until 2100, okay? Um, and they have these five variables. And, and, and you can see here, um, essentially, uh, how each of these variables uh, uh, behaves. And I, and I just have some snippets as to, um, you know, how, um, how these variables um, behave. First, the first one is that, um, that the limited resource pool is exhausted. So you can see that resources curve drops um, between abundance in, in 1900, or that, that was the starting the starting resource pool in 1900, and then in you know in 200 years uh, you essentially consume all the resources. Um, you can see that um, that food production grows um, essentially at the beginning due to resource availability. So there's resource available, there's technology, so you can, you know, you can, you can use water and you can use energy to produce food. Um, but at, after these resources start um, being depleted, then the ability to produce food decreases. And that's sort of the, sort of the collapsing part of, of, the, of the system that, they, that this study shares with the work of Malthus. Um, 
Population also can grow because of, of resource and the food availability. So there's resources, there's pr food production, so people can grow. But of course, when resources start running out and food production starts um, uh, slowing down, then you know population also um, you know starts decreasing. And industrial pollution and, and, and sorry, industrial output and pollution pretty much follow the same trend. There's a um, um, you know while there's resources and there's population, uh, you know industrial output this capital will, will grow there'll be more machines there'll be more production of, of other things um, and but that generates pollution um, and um, and um, and both of those grow of course as again because the resource pool is being shut down and the resources go essentially decrease to a point where there's pretty much not available anymore um, you know, eventually capital output and pollution itself, um, you know, die away. Uh, there's a little bit of a lag on pollution because the, the underlying assumption here is that um, pollution probably, you know, takes some time to develop or at least to be noticed uh, um, in, in the system. So that's the, you know, the overall gist of it. Um, so this is the kind of thing, the kind of, um, of analysis that um, this world three model allowed to do it allowed to look at these five variables in an interlocking relationship with each other. So these variables don't be you know don't operate independently. They are very much interactive with each other, and how the collective of the five of them would evolve in a period of two hundred years. Okay, so that was the that was the value. Um, that um, that I see in this study. Unfortunately, as I said, I think people focused more on the on the sort of the 2100 result and saying, oh, so you're saying we're all going to die, that food's going to go away, population's going to go away. So um, and uh, so that's sort of the the um, it's like 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 Malthus. It sort of discredited or, or or people didn't pay too much attention to it. But there's a lot of value in 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 in, in how and tying you know these variables together and, and seeing how um, how they interacted. Um, the nice thing about about models and um, the world three is no exception is is that it allows us it allows us to look at uh, you know what if scenarios you know what if we started with a with a world that had twice we had twice as many resources as we have now so. Um, you know what would that do, and and essentially, um, um, so let let's say an, an, an example is you know what you know like like it has happened. What if we discover more oil reserves, or we have better ways to access groundwater and uh, and minerals? Okay, so um, so there's more resources, and in this in this particular simulation um, of the model, uh, there were twice as the base simulation that was presented before, so more resources. And essentially what happens is that um, the, the resource availability actually delays the decreasing limb of population. So it's still, you know, even if you have twice as many resources, and, and, and that's, that's what the, the model simulated, even if you have twice as many resources, um, you, you, you end up in a situation where uh, resources are going to be depleted. Of course, they, they get depleted later on, so there's a delay. Um, but nonetheless, if there's a delay in resource availability, there'll be also a decrease in associated um, uh, population, uh, food, and industrial output. Okay, so it's sort of the same finding. It's just that it happens later because you have more resources. Um, it's like you know having you know, having more money in your bank account and then, you know, losing your job, you're going to be able to sort of live off longer, but eventually if you don't find a job, the situation won't be sustainable. So that's a little bit of the same, same assumption. Um, and um, now in this particular case, resources are, are not wiped out completely. You can see actually that at the end, the resource pool sort of picks up, um, but it's... Um, it is severely depleted compared to its initial about abundance, um, and um, um, so this scenario, twice as many resources, indicates that you're still headed for an unsustainable um, output or outcome, um, but it just happens later. Okay, so that's sort of the the um, you know the the five second version of it. 
So, well, then they push the envelope even further. So what happens if we have a world with unlimited resources? This means that resources um, are, are there. You have a, have a, a, a vast pool, okay? Um, and um, in this case, uh, you essentially, um, you have sort of infinite resources, but they're still consumed. So you're still consuming them. Um, and um, now what happens if you have infinite resources is that you start, it, it, it's, this is where the trade-off comes in. Um, if you have infinite resources, you're able to produce a lot more food. You're able to produce a lot more industrial capital, industrial output. Population is able to grow more, but then pollution takes off. So you, you generate enormous amounts of pollution. Um, and then that, um, in, in turn, um, um, affects, because it increases the, the, the death rate of population. So if there's more, pollu more pollution, the assumption is that more pollution will affect population growth because it will increase the risk of death of population. People will get sick um, um, because the, you know, the water is polluted, the air is polluted. Um, so, uh, so population actually is indeed affected by it. Um, and, um, and look at the, uh, at the industrial output and, and, uh, and food production towards the end where they really start increasing. I, I want to I ask you to think about that and, 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 and answer why, you know, why that happens. I, I want you to comment on, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the group page on, on, that, on that question, okay? It's a, you got to think a little bit about this dynamics, but I want to more intuitively um, try to make you think about this, okay? Well, then they looked at, at you know, at a whole variety of scenarios. So they had um, a, uh, a world uh, with unlimited resources, but pollution control. So this is a, a, a world where the resource pool was very large and there were pollution controls, so pollution can, could not go above certain value. So there was some, maybe a technology or some technological innovation that would allow um, uh, for, um, um, for pollution to be kept in check. Um, so essentially the outcome of this is that the population grows more, uh, the food availability becomes scarcer because you know, now you have population growing uncontrollably because there's nothing to impede it. There's plenty of resources, there's plenty of food because you can produce it. Um, and, uh, but as population starts growing, um, it will overtake uh, food production capability. Um, and, um, and then, you know, as you consume these resources, uh, then it becomes harder to produce industrial capital output um, and, um, um, and uh, eventually things go down. You know, and pollution eventually, I mean, it, it will, the, the fact that it's controlled doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It, it will occur, but it'll just be occur much slower. Um, and, um, and then there's another scenario at the right, um, uh, which is the same, you know, unlimited resources, pollution controls, but then, uh, increased agricultural productivity. So this is the scenario in which you're able to produce more food with the same resources. Okay. Um, and, uh, it just, um, it essentially, uh, sort of exacerbates these trends. Uh, so it's a sort of the same, um, a little bit of the same output. It's just that it's, um, um, a little bit more accentuated the, these trends. So, um, what happens if you have unlimited resources, pollution controls, and now you have uh, birth control? So you you have a way to control population by regulating uh, the birth the birth rate of population. Okay, that's the scenario on the left. And the scenario on the right um, is the same, but it has the increased agricultural productivity, so more more food production. Um, so the outcome of this is that uh, because population is controlled, um, food production and industrial output per person grow very fast. But then pollution also, it's even if you, even if you have it controlled, it, it will it will grow uh, because you're you know you're generating more food, you're generating more output. Industrial activity generates pollution, um, and um, and essentially all this growth of of food production, industrial production, uh, drive down resource availability, okay? So essentially resources are, are depleted in both cases. Um, and then, you know, the nice thing is that you can start looking at all these different scenarios. Um, and uh, uh, these two, um, I think are a little bit unrealistic because uh, these are scenarios in which, um, uh, in, in which you have what's called a stabilized population. So this is a situation where, um, 
uh, by some magical <laughs> rule, you're able to say, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll, we will grow world population to this level and stop, okay? Um, but it's, it's useful to just look at the outcomes. And, you know, the outcomes of this, uh, it's that the, um, the pollution is kept in check, um, you know, uh, because um, the growth is limited. Um, and, but the abil ability to produce food is, is limited by, by resources. Um, and um, so that's another, you know, that's another, um, um, you know, another outcome of this. Um, and both are pretty much the same. Um, then they looked at what's called a, a sta stabilized uh, world model, and um, and um, again, stabilization is brought up about by controlling population, which I think is completely unrealistic. Um, and um, now, industrial output and food production are kept efficient over time, um, and um, and independent of resources and and, and better technologies. Uh, so that's the um, you know that's you know that's um, a a piece of it. Um, now, by depleting um, less resources, then pollution is kept in check. But again, uh, these are sort of unrealistic uh, scenarios. And I, and I think, in retrospect, um, considering these scenarios, um, I, I think subtracted a little bit of credibility to the study. Um, and I, I would have, uh, I probably would have, even if I included, maybe I would include just one for, for the sakes of showing, but nothing else. Unfortunately, they went into a stabilized world model too, um, and um, in, in this model, they um, it's characterized by introducing birth control and better technologies for food and industrial production in, in 1975 on, on the left um, simulation and 2000 in the right side simulation. Um, and the outcomes of this is that pollution is kept in check um, and resource depletion is curbed, um, and um, but this 25-year delay in, in policy implementation, which is what they wanted to show, is the delay of implementing these policies, uh, delay stabilization. So I think that that was the you know the um, and those were the major scenarios run in, in the World Three model. So um, let's shift gears a little bit and, and talk about um, you know the kinds of things, the kinds of topics that that. Um, we're going to be discussing, and I, I want to start. I wanted to start the the um, the intuitive intuitive um, introduction of system dynamics by by using some very simple uh, examples uh, initially. Um, and uh, I'll talk about your bank account, your or my bank account, your personal bank account. I'll talk about your body weight. Um, um, I'll talk about population growth. So we'll look at, at, at more of a collective uh, variable. Uh, talk about water in a lake uh, and the global economy. Okay, so let's try to try to tackle these issues. Let's look at the bank, uh, your bank account, and and um, and your bank account. Essentially, if you if you uh, think about um, what you look quantitative for in your bank account, it's essentially uh, the amount of money that's stored in your bank account. Okay, now that amount of money in your bank account is not. A static variable. It's a variable that, that changes over time. It changes over time because um, you have inputs of of uh, of money, um, and they, those may come uh, through income or deposits into your account. But you also have um, outputs, and th these can be expenses, investments, uh, any you know any other any other um, money that comes out. And then internally within the account, you have um, essentially. Uh, also, inputs and outputs um, that are that are dependent on the amount of money that's there, um, and and I, I want to make the distinction because um, and we'll we'll make this more clear later on about inputs and outputs that are dependent on the variable itself and those that are not, and um, and uh, for the most part, um, um, you know, your income and and your deposits um, uh, may be. For the most part, maybe independent. Uh, you know, your salary—it's not really dependent on the amount of money you have in your bank account. Um, but if you look at other sort of, you know, like interest and, and fees and charges, um, uh, they're 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 add or subtract from bank account. Those might be dependent on the amount of money that you have. Now, if you add all these things up, you know what you have in there plus what comes out in minus what comes out, then you have an idea of how that bank account quantity variable is changing over time okay so so I want to keep that that notion um, um, 
in you know in in, um, in terms of this is their, this particular example. Um, another another simple one is is your body, and in in the body weight is also another quantitative variable that you keep track of, and and that is your the body mass or or your weight. Okay, now your body weight again not a static variable. It will have um, it be influenced by inputs, you know, like food, um, and outputs like you know ex excretions or you know surgery. I don't know if you, I don't know, do a liposuction or something or you know whatever it is. Um, a little bit classic, crass example. But there also will be these, um, um, you know, within um, you know inputs and outputs that are dependent on your body mass. Uh, you know, like your exercise or your diet. You know, you know. Um, um, you and I um, have different body weights, and if you if you go out there and run four miles, and if I go out there and run four miles, the outputs are not going to be the same, just because um, it is a it, it, that that output is going to be dependent on uh, you know the specific body mass, and and uh, I'm simplifying things a little bit, but you get the idea. Again, um, another system where you have a quantitative variable that's affected by inputs and outputs. And thus, it varies over time. Okay. Next one, a little bit less individual, is population growth. So let's say you're looking at um, at a city, a country, a state, or you know, and and you your variable is the number of people. Okay. Well, number of people is is, is not or not, the population in, in city, state, country, uh, whatever entity, it's not a static variable. It will be affected by by inflows and uh, the inflows could be net migration, positive or negative. Um, it could be net, a net migration into into the location or out of the location, um, and um, uh, the output of that or or the um, um, is, is, is deaths um, that are are related to um, 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 you know anything that has to do with. With accidents or or just people dying naturally, and, and then there's of course uh, the um, the births and deaths uh, that occur naturally within the system. Okay, um, so again, the balance of, of these inputs and outputs will give you the dynamic changes in um, in population. Okay, and we're going to be looking at these in in a fair amount of detail uh, in this class, but I wanted to sort of plant in, in your brains uh, the sort of the logic of this. Okay, this. This sort of uh, adding inputs and outputs and, and trying to see how those change over time. If you look at water in a lake, it's a it's the same the same reasoning. Um, the quantity you're likely to look for is the volume of water in that lake, um, and that's affected by inputs and primarily those are going to be rainfall. There might be other inputs as well, and there'll be outputs like you know infiltration through the ground, there'll be runoff discharges to rivers or to the ocean from the lake. Um, and, um, and then there'll be, you know, primarily an output that depends on the amount of water in the lake and that's the evaporation. So the evaporation depends on the amount of water in the lake. So if, if I want to keep track of this, if this quantitative variable of, of water in the lake, I need to look at all these inputs and outputs and see how they shake up. Okay. Let's look at agricultural production, another one. Uh, so, um, so in this case, the quantitative variable should be, you know, be the agricultural products. And this could be, you know, um, tons of, of corn or tons of, um, of wheat that are produced or, or that, are, uh, that, um, that are present uh, you know, in a farm or in a, in a state. Again, it, it depends on, 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 the, on the system and, and there'll be inputs. Um, um, inputs uh, such as land and fertilizers or outputs, um, which which is the amount of food that's generated, that's uh, produced, and it's uh, it's driven, it's it's sold to the markets or or it's distributed to to some to some uh, supply chain. And then there's um you know the um, the decay or the loss, uh, you know uh, um, you know a fraction of, of the crops are lost to to you know naturally to weather issues or to. Uh, um, um, you know, to decay, natural decay. So again, um, the the balance of these inputs and outputs will tell you a little bit about how agricultural production will evolve over time. Want to move into something bigger and better? Let's look at the global economy. Um, well, I sort of put this in there, but I was just kidding. We're really not ready. 
for this one just yet. Uh, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. And there's a useful lesson here. So we need to start small and start by looking at small systems. You know, your body weight, your bank account, you know, population of a of a you know small system and see how that changes before understand those before um, we move on to understanding larger systems okay so let's just not get ahead of ourselves I threw it in there just to generate a reaction now of course you can you can pretty much appreciate that these systems are are not independent so if you look at the you know at water and energy and other issues they're they're connected and, and um, so if you have a um, you know let's take the population system that we just looked at and and we looked at the water in the lake all the system we looked at and, and we can think of uh, these two systems interacting uh, so for example um, you know uh, the volume of water the availability of that water the water feeds the population um, it's it, it will have an impact on on, on the health of, of, of um, of the people which will affect uh, births and deaths so if you have good quality water plenty available uh, you have you have capability of having more births but if you have little water available or poor quality then then you have um, you know you have more potential for death so there's a connection between these two systems th through health there could be another connection number you know the number of people affect evaporation through essentially development you know more people the more people the more roads the more infrastructure you need the uh, that affects that you know decreases the evaporation the natural evaporation of, of, of the of the system and um, you know you sort of alter the cycle the cycling of water okay so you generate a uh, a, a a balance there um and um you know um other events such as um, you know excessive runoff, uh, you know natural disasters or flood can can affect um, you know have an impact on on creating additional deaths in the system that will affect population. So you can see how these systems become connected and it's they're not really independent or completely independent of each other. And and part of our job in this class is to find not only what these connections are but how we quantify them. Okay, so we're going to be looking at these. Um, and we can actually do, you know, connect more systems. Let's say, we, let's take the two systems that are connected now and then look at, at the another subsystem that we looked at, the agricultural production, and we can say, well, you know, um, uh, the availability of water uh, through either infiltration or runoff um, will affect the land availability. For, so, for example, if you flood a piece of land, it, will, it won't be available for, for harvest of, 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 of a crop and, and, you know, you sort of affect agricultural production. Um, the amount of food uh, feeds directly into the number of people that can be supported. Uh, so that's another connection between these systems. Um, and um, um, the variety uh, or the ability of agricultural production to grow may affect, may attract or detract uh, migration. Um, and uh, that's, a, you know, that's a common problem in, in many countries um, uh, where uh, mass migration, you know, mass migrant workers um, 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 move move between one country and the next, or one one city and the next, to work on, on the fields and agriculture. So it's a big, it's a big, uh, a big interaction that happens uh, worldwide. So, um, so you can see that how you know how these systems start connecting, how um, the influences, the mutual interactions, and these mutual influences are are not trivial to to predict up hand. And this is um, this is one of the reasons why we need modeling. Um, and um, so my pitch for why do we need modeling, you know, first of all, we need to be quantitative. Um, and um, in order to design effective policies, we need to understand quantitatively what's going on. Um, um, we need to be able to forecast, even if, even if we're wrong and, and, and more forecasts are wrong, um, um, the ability to forecast does point you in the direction of a trend that, that might enable you to 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 launch a policy or to implement a policy or to make decisions and they are important um, I think another another key use um, of, of modeling is, is assimilating data so uh, there is data that's collected and and, um, and models allow you to use that data to essentially analyze it and extract results and um, and um, you know anything from the simplest uh, you know like a linear regression which is a 
which is a tool that most of you might be familiarized with. It's, it, that's a model in itself. Um, and models are really thinking aids. Okay, I, I, um, in this class, for the most part, we're not going to be um, looking to models as, as um, you know, as predictors, but more as thinking aids. And, and one piece of advice that I, that I give you now is that it's, 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 it is best to never use the word prediction when you refer to a model, because you're going to be wrong no matter what. Um, but actually, models are not really intended, or at least the models we're going to be discussing here, are not intended to predict. They're intended more to help us think, to analyze data, to to um, to forecast. And forecast um, has a big, uh, you know, big uncertainty to it that we'll discuss. And and uh, and uh, and models give us the ability to be quantitative, but not really to predict. So I want to I want to I want to um, sort of take that word out of the vocabulary in this class right now um, as, as, a, as a piece of advice, okay? Now, for this class, we're going to be using a piece of software um, that's, that's called Vensim. Um, and um, I've already asked you to, to download it and install it, and we'll, we'll spend a couple of sessions um, learning how to use it and, 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 and using it to set up our our models, um, but it's a, um, you know, the gist of it is that it's a tool that's easy to use to in, in, in assembling and running system dynamics um, models and, and, and as well as analyzing the simulation results, okay? Now, um, it's not the only piece of software is available, but it has, in my opinion, it has a very simple interface that, that's easy easy to learn very quickly, um, and it's also free of charge for classroom use, and that's a big criteria right there. So I'm not going to deny that. And and um, you can you can look at some background uh, on the tool itself here uh, for some history and background of, of the tool, and we're going to be um, uh, you know looking at that more closely. Okay, so uh, let me give you a preview into next uh, lecture materials. Uh, we're going to be formally introducing the discipline of system dynamics modeling, and system dynamics is going to be uh, the family of tools that we're going to use to build uh, and analyze uh, systems uh, And uh, for this class. Uh, we're going to be also looking at the concept of modeling in a little bit more detail. Uh, in, in the broader sense, as a field of inquiry, as a field of research, as a field of professional activity, and particularly how it applies to sustainability problems. We're going to be discussing uh, the components of a system dynamics model, um, and also we're going to outline the steps to start to gradually build a system dynamics model that's going to be tailored to your individual term project. So we're going to be looking at that next week. Some closing items for today. Uh, so I've created a, a, a discussion group for the class, um, and it, it's actually uh, it's actually been implemented on Facebook. And here's the link to the Facebook group. The nice thing about doing this on Facebook is that uh, Facebook groups uh, the members do not have to be friends on Facebook. So that means that you sort of have separate lives. Uh, you have your your pictures and your friends on one end, and then this is a uh, all business uh, for this class. Um, I've had very good experiences in the past doing this. Uh, also for uh, class material storage and distribution purposes, uh, I have created a, a folder on Dropbox and here's the link to that folder. And uh, here you will find all class materials at any point during the semester. Uh, so um, you'll be able to find you know, the, the videos, the readings, everything's gonna be there. It's a very nice feature to have. And I'm going to give you your first assignment. So your first assignment is going to be uh, very simple. Uh, you're going to be asked to join the class uh, Facebook discussion group and also access a Dropbox folder and then report back. And uh, by reporting back, I mean, uh, you know, not calling, not emailing, just post it on the Facebook page and we should all be all good. So that's it, folks, for this week. I hope uh, you enjoy the rest of the week and I'll see you next time.